G'day, Ben from Duck Plain Chicken here with another video on the UC Hardgraph main battle tank 135th scale from Bandai. This episode is going to be all about the painting of the tank. And the first thing I've done is primed everything black. So you can see the turret here. It's uh, I've just used SMS black primer and thankfully I'm still getting all that detail come out, which is good to see. And before I sort of get into the overall painting of the tank, because I will be painting it pretty much one color, it's going to be sort of a buff color. There are some sort of areas that need masking. So we have a look at the uh, photos they've provided. We can see on the hatch here, there's kind of this little uh, piece on the inside of the hatch that needs to be masked off. So I need to mask that off. But probably the more fiddly stuff is the, the wheels themselves. And this is probably not clear on the photos here, but certainly in the picture on the front. You can see these road wheels, they would have some sort of rubber based material around them. Um, and of course that would be sort of in a black color, whereas the, the hubs of the wheels are all the, the main tank color. So what I want to do is mask off the wheels so that I can do that. Of course, all the wheels are already primed in black, so I'll be just using that black for the base color. And then I'll be using weathering products to sort of weather it up a bit. So to show you what the sort of masking looks like, um, basically I'm cutting out a, a circle and um, masking off the, the rubber area. So these are just a couple that I've sort of already started working on. And so I'm going to talk about um, showing you how to do that. Now I understand for this next bit, some of you might not have the tools that I'm going to show. And so I'd like to sort of point out that this is pretty straightforward if you wanted to just brush paint the black. Um, it's maybe, I'll try to get close enough. There's actually a ridge there that you could run a paintbrush up against. So um, it wouldn't actually be that difficult to sort of paint by hand. But, you know, if you're watching my videos, you know how much I love my tools. So, um, first of all, this is what I had originally. Uh, and this is probably the most common sort of tool out here for, out there for cutting circles for masking. Um, now, me personally, I've always struggled with this particular tool. I'm not even sure what brand this is. Is this... Uh, yeah, I can't even remember who makes this one. But there's a whole lot of them out there and, you know, they vary in quality. But these things I find really awkward to use. So I won't be using that today. What I will be using is this. Which, uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce that. Is that Dispay? Dispay? Um, and this is the MTEC circle cutter. Now this thing looks like a serious bit of kit and it look it's not cheap It's certainly not as cheap as you know something like this um, It's incredibly well made but for me personally and this is not like a full review of the product but What I really struggled with was the initial setup of it There's no sort of instructions provided with it and out of the box. It's a bit sort of tricky to, to deal with however saying that the results you get from it once you've got it dialed in are fantastic. So let's get some tape on the, the table and then I can sort of talk about that, uh, that thing. What I've got here is some 40 millimeter tape. So I can see that that's going to give me plenty of room to cut the circle out. I'm going to lay a long strip of that on my cutting mat and flatten that down. And the way that this circle cutter works is you have to rotate this a particular way, but you can see the cutting tool is here. If I turn it upside down, you can see the this uh, sharp sort of needle thing. It's actually a, a blade. Um, and you have to rotate it a particular way. Um, but what it does is it rotates that cutting tool so you get a nice round um, circle. Now the way you determine uh, the diameter of the circle you're cutting is by setting the radius here. 
Now, I know that the circles or the, the hole I need to cut out is needs to be 20 millimeters wide, so I've set the radius to 10. And you can see this will do, you know, this will cut out circles up to sort of around 50 millimeters. It's probably a bit less, but um, yeah, it, it cuts out circles quite a large size. So the next thing I need to do is put this down on the surface and then simply turn and lift off. Now you probably can't see that, but if I take my tweezers and lift out this circle, you'll see how nice a job it does. That, that is a perfect circle. And I can tell you now, using uh, this particular tool, I cannot get results like that. I know other people can. I know people do roundels and all sorts of things with this particular tool. And, you know, they are, <laughs> they are more accomplished than I am, that's for sure. This tool is built for numpties like me. It just, you know, once you've got it dialed in, it sort of, it just works. So I'm gonna do a couple more while I'm here. One thing, one problem I have with this is it's kind of awkward to work out where the circle's going to, uh, where the circle's gonna cut. So I need to do a few of them because there's actually like a dozen road wheels or something. But you're probably just getting a bit of an idea of how quickly you can get this done. Um, so for me, you know, that's a real winner. All right, and then I can go through with my tweezers, pick out all these circles. Right, there we go. Now the next thing I need to do is sort of cut just roughly around the circle. It doesn't have to be perfect. It's literally just sort of uh, just cut around, just removing a lot of the excess around the edge. Because the part that we're actually masking is quite small. Now let's try and peel this up carefully. Of course we don't wanna we don't wanna rip it. Okay, so now we've got this sort of donut mask. The next step is to try and line it up on the wheel. So I find it helps if you sort of start on one one side and then try to get the other side in place. So I'm just trying to get the tape to sit right on the edge of the rim. I need to increase my radius just a little bit. Okay, so finish this down. All right. So you can see now that's sort of burnished down. Nice clean circle. And I just sort of fold this stuff over. I'll repeat the process for the back side. So you can see that's what I've done on this one. And then I'll take a bit of Tamiya tape and sort of just run it around the middle wear so that way it's completely sort of masked off. And that's ready for the main colour of the tank. So that's the process I use for masking. Like I said, don't worry if you haven't got those, you know, if you haven't got a fancy sort of circle cutter like this one, um, don't stress. You can do it. You'll be able to do it by brush, no worries. Um, and then when you put enough weathering, weathering products over, it's probably not going to matter that much anyway. For this particular part, I am going to lay some tape down over it. And what I want to do is to start burnishing it down and finding those edges because it is the edges I'll be using to run my knife along to mask off this area. I'll take my scalpel and just gently, gently run it around the edge. 
And this is a, another piece where you really don't need to mask it. You could brush paint it. So as you're lifting the tape off, you want to check those uh, check those corners. And the final step is just going around, making sure it's burnished down properly. And so that way we should get a reasonably clean uh, sort of shape there once we paint the rest of it. So once I've finished the, the masking of the wheels, the next step is the painting. So I, I'm sort of uh, torn between two colours, uh, both being SMS colours, so whether I go with buff or Russian sand. Buff is lighter and I think that will probably be better just because I'll be able to darken up the tank in places using you know, things like oils. So I think um, I'll probably go for this SMS buff. But I won't really know until I get it down on the tank whether that colour is uh, suitable or not. So um, I'll come back and I'll show you what that looks like. Okay, I've got the base coat done and it's probably looking a little bit lighter on camera than it actually is but I'm pretty happy with this color so what I ended up using was SMS buff and given that this tank is so big I actually went through two and a half bottles of this stuff just to get the base coat down so just be warned you are going to go through the paint and that's just after a series of sort of light coats now because I did black primer underneath I am getting some sort of variation a little bit of variation here and there in the color which is good and that will sort of add to the kind of weathering effect so I use the buff for the bulk of the uh, the tank so it's sort of all you know, ready to go for the engine details there's a couple of sort of other bits that I did sort of different colors so there's these engine details and the seat and for that I used SMS charcoal before I sort of unmask uh, the wheels just to see how that went um, I want to talk a little bit about the clear parts so there's a number of sort of clear parts uh, that make up sort of the uh, periscopes and cupola I guess um, so what I've done is I've masked the front of the glass bits that are going to show and on the back I will spray a clear green. So I'm just going to use the SMS clear green for that. So that'll be the next bit of spraying I do. So let's have a look and see how these, uh, how these wheels turned out. Um, I didn't show it before but I also masked the small rollers as well. Um, see how they look uh, fingers crossed my circle mask worked okay I don't think they uh, I don't think I've got any reason to believe they didn't okay look at that brand new straight off the factory floor uh, tank road wheel <laughs> And of course that's going to be dirtied up a lot with the, the weathering I'm going to do, but uh, the masking worked um, pretty well. So happy with that. And if we have a look at these uh, rollers here. The thing is that a lot of this is not even going to be seen. Uh, the side sort of skirts that come down along the tracks you know, are going to hide a lot of the, the wheel detail, but I don't know it will be there. Yep, so that came up pretty well. All right, so um, I'm gonna go through and unmask all the, the rest of the wheels I've got. The next step I'll be taking you through is the decals because I wanna get the decals down before I start the weathering. Now, there is a minimal amount of decals included with this kit. Of course, all these ones I've taken out the bottom here, these are for the figures but they give you decals for two variants so basically one of the variants has these sort of large two of these large arrows on each side and the number 131 and the variant i'm doing has these little devices here 
So there's not a huge number of sort of decals on, on here, but there's one that's actually quite interesting because um, if we have a look at the EFGF uh, logo here, this goes on the back of the tank, but on the photo etch, they also include the same device cut into the photo etch. So you technically could do like a traditional sort of spray uh, stencil if you wanted to. You could just sort of, you know, tape this to the side and then spray over the top and you get exactly the same. As I've just checked if I overlay it, it is the same as the decal that's provided. So I just thought that was interesting to sort of call that out. I probably won't be doing that unless I miss up the, the decal. And so the decals I'm going to be doing is uh, this sort of uh, arrow device on the side skirts. So first thing I need to do, of course, is cut them out. And of course, to soak the decals in water. I'm just using room temperature water here. You can use warm water if you want to sort of speed the process up a bit. I never find I have to. And these devices go on these side skirts here. Um, obviously one goes one way, one goes the other. Okay, the decals have started to lift and the first thing I would do is put down some microset. So I've spoken about applying decals in plenty of my other videos, so I don't think I'll go too in depth in this one. But what I'm gonna do is just apply some microset where the decal needs to go. And then take the decal and dab off the excess water. Now I'm just using a uh, toothpick to sort of guide the, the decal into place. Now, I am conscious of the fact that uh, my experience of doing the figures was that these decals are quite fragile, so I just need to be sort of careful moving them around. Uh, this one seems to have not given me any grief at all. all right, I think that's about right, actually. So now I just take a cotton bud and squeegee out the excess water. Okay, so you can see that's how it sort of looks. And then the final step is to take some microsol, and this will soften the decal and allow it to really bed down properly. I mean, this is on a flat surface, so it's really not that bad, but it also helped to dissolve some of the clear carrier film that sits around the edge because um, that will help uh, reduce any sort of silvering which is where air gets trapped under the decal and gives you sort of a gives your decals a bit of a silver look it's not desirable you want a, a painted on look if you can and I'll probably, I'll leave that for a while. Um, then I'll probably apply another lot of um, microsol over it in a little bit. But that's essentially the process of decals. Like I said, there's not a lot of decals in this kit, so it shouldn't take me too long to, uh, to get them sorted. Uh, just to show you how the decals are looking. Um, they're coming up all right. I am getting a little bit of silvering on some of the others. So I'm just adding more and more microsol to try and soften those decals a bit more but um, they're coming up all right and again you know if you watch the video on my figures um, these decals are quite brittle so I did have a couple of breaks but uh, thankfully I was able to able to fix it uh, the next thing that I want to do on the kit is a little bit of brush painting so there are some sort of details on the kit that need um, you know a bit of extra color it's not all just this buff color. So an example is, if we have a look at the end here, we have a couple of lights at the bottom here, uh, just near the door. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use uh, this Model Air 
7164 chrome. And then I can go in with some clear color paint to uh, finish off the lights. So, so take a minimal amount of paint. And of course, because I'm using water-based acrylics over the um, over the top of lacquers, if I stuff it up, it's not going to be the end of the world. I will be able to fix it. It will also be you know, some weathering. So you kind of get the idea. Nothing special there. Okay, so they're both done. Also, on the top of the hull, we have these lights here. Now, I don't think I glued them in place. I might just, yeah, I didn't. So that'll make it a little bit easier to paint. And of course, these have, um, they do have clear, uh, clear parts that go around the, uh, the top of these. And this can be a bit easier to paint while I'm holding them in a clip. So it's really just getting the reflector painted. You're hardly going to see it, but um, so you can sort of see that silver in there. And finally, on these front covers, there is a tiny little, I think they're indicator lights here. So I think they need to be painted clear orange. So just a dab of chrome in there. There are a couple of other bits that need some detail painting. I might do them off camera. Um, so the tools that are lying on the side here, I'm just going to use probably a brown for the handles and a, a dark, really dark grey for you know the shovel uh, head, the axe head. Um, they do include sort of detail where the lights are, like the wiring, but you're never going to see it, so I'm not going to bother painting that because there is a cover that sort of goes over the top. But if you wanted to show it with a cover off, you know, maybe one of the guys maintaining it or something, you can do that. Um, and then I need to do the tops of the smoke launchers. So I'm just going to use a sort of dark grey for those. Um, you sort of see how the decals came up there. There's still a little bit of silvering. So I'm still going to do a few more layers of microsol on that. The other little bit of detail painting I have to do is the ropes. So I might actually show you how I do those on camera because I've got to paint the, the cable as well. All right, so I finished the detail painting. So you can see the, the tools there. And for that, I just used Mecha Color 69040 Phantom Grey and for the handles I used 69034 Brown so nothing too complex there and of course they'll be weathered up along with the rest of the the tank done just the top of the smoke launchers and again I just use the Phantom Grey for that and then for the tow cables I have painted the ends of them and for that I used again just this phantom grey and so I wanted to show you how I intend on painting the actual cable itself so I'm going to take one of my stands and set the tow cable up so that it's actually taut across the stand and what that'll do is that'll allow me to easily paint the cable so you can sort of see there I've just got it sort of lined up you know it's reasonably tight I don't want it too tight or otherwise it'll break and then I'm going to be using this uh, Baheo model wash and black and this is an acrylic product I believe so Give it a good shake to open this up. Use a, a brush and just really literally liberally run it across. And because this is 
like very fine rope or string um, it'll soak in there the other thing is a little bit of the white will come through but it almost looks as though it's highlighted um, yeah looks like the the metal of the cable sort of um, has been scratched and, and worn so on that but at least it's a consistent color a bit, a bit tricky to show but uh, you get the idea it's just literally black I mean you could just use watered down uh, black paint uh, so I'll leave that to dry and then I think we're good to go might uh, keep that taut so the thing is when you're painting with like something that's quite thin you don't want really a sag in here otherwise all the paint will sort of collect in the middle there so so all the decals are in place and I've put a flat coat over everything and the reason I wanted to put a flat coat on was just because the weathering technique I'm going to use it just works a bit better if it's not a gloss surface um, the SMS paints that I use they're sort of semi gloss when you put them on down so I put a flat coat over everything so that the oils that I'm going to use for the weathering process sort of stick properly so this is an example of one that hasn't been weathered yet. This is the side skirts, and here is the uh, the other side skirt that has been weathered. So you can see it's basically a whole lot of sort of streaking. And I've tried to keep it reasonably subtle, but if you look at the difference between the two of them, you'll notice there's actually sort of an overall color difference because I went with the lighter sort of buff color. Um, I was a bit concerned that the weathering, you know, might change the color too much, but I'm actually really happy with the way that it's come out, sort of got a warmer tone to it, and uh, it looks as though it's sort of come across some dirt and grime, and then rains come along and sort of streaked it down the sides. So what I'm going to do is show you the process that I use for weathering. There are certainly armor modelers out there who are very experienced at this sort of thing and I am still learning and finding my way around it, but at least you'll see how I do it. So the first step is to take off these little pieces here because of course I want their streaks to go down and sort of appear you know, as if they travel all the way down the wall. If I leave these in place, it's just harder to sort of get the streak um, process working properly. So the first step is to get some detail on the panel lines. And what I use for that is, to me, is panel line accent color brown. Give this stuff a good shake. And I'm gonna very roughly sort of go around the panel lines. I'm not being very careful because a lot of this is going to come off anyway when I start with the uh, taking everything off with the, the thinner that I'm going to use. I'm being quite rough. When you do panel lining you sort of get a, an appreciation for how much detail has gone into this kit. A lot of the surface detail is uh, fantastic. Now a lot of the stuff that I'm doing here will actually probably most of it will wash out. But some of it will stick and it just helps give that level of realism of where dirt and grime would get stuck in all recesses. And everything I'm going to do at this stage is all enamel or oil based. Now because I've done all my painting with uh, all the base color in lacquers, the enamels, the oils won't react with the underlying paint. So it makes it very safe to work with. And it also means that I can you know, use a couple of different sort of products. I mean, this panel line stuff is pretty much just a very diluted oil paint uh, or enamel paint. Okay, so I'm pretty happy with that. 
Next step is to wipe most of this excess off. So like any panel line stuff I do, I use this shellite stuff. Um, you can, of course, use enamel thinner. I use this stuff because it's cheap and it works really well. And I've got uh, some of it sort of in a tray here. You can see I've been messing with oils and stuff, so it's not particularly clean, but it doesn't matter. So I'm just going to take a lot of this stuff off. And I'm not too fussed about having it super clean because once I get some of the other oils in place, it's not going to matter. Remember, weathering is not uniform. It is not um, ordered in any way. It's rough and random. So you want to make sure that whatever weathering techniques you use, you're sort of uh, you know, reflecting what would happen in reality. Yeah, I think that's pretty good. It's pretty rough, but it's uh, fine. So you can get an idea there's still some sort of staining there. Uh, but a lot of that's going to come out in a minute. So unlike the kits I normally do, where I try to keep all the panel lining really crisp and clean, this is something that's different. Now for these little foot stands, I'm going to again use this uh, to me product. Because I want all the dirt that sort of uh, falls within this diamond plate texture. Think about you know, guys sort of stepping on it all the time, it would accumulate a lot of uh, a lot of dirt and grime. Okay, now for the uh, the next step, I'll be using a series of oil paints, and these are um, 502 Abtilung uh, oil paints. Now these are all paints designed specifically for modelling. You can buy of course other brands um, but I do recommend you get a good quality oil paint don't go with the cheaper nasty ones they just don't have the kind of pigment density you need to to do this process properly so um, I really like these a tube of this is going to last you forever you know for this if you're doing this kind of weathering you are not going to go through one of these tubes in a hurry so you'll see how little of it I'm actually going to use in a minute so the colours I'm going to use are uh, light mud, so that'll be the first step. The next step will be this earth colour. And then I'm going to use some snow white. And I'll explain why I'm going to use that when I get around to it. Uh, but that'll be the next step. Now, there are some areas on the tank, sort of around the wheels and uh, axles and what have you, where I'll use just a tiny bit of engine grease just to give that sort of darker um, darker appearance of yeah, grease and grime sort of um, leaking. Now, starting off with the, um, the light mud, simply open up the tube and take a toothpick. So I'm not even putting this on a palette or anything. And I'm just going to get on the end of the toothpick. And I'm just going to put some random, random marks around the, the piece. I'm just dabbing on a little bit. Doesn't have to be a huge amount. Just little bits here and there. Put that to the side. And the next step is sort of where the, the magic of it happens. And that's where I take the shellite and I take a uh, reasonably small sort of flat brush, dunk it in the, uh, the shellite and then I sort of wipe off the, the excess. And then remember keeping in mind how the weathering occurs. So I'm going to go in a vertical motion and I'm just going to streak it down. Yeah, it looks pretty rough to start off with, and that's all, that's fine. The great thing about using oil-based products is they take forever to dry. So you can literally sort of do some weathering using this process and then come back sometimes weeks later 
and just reactivate the oils by um, you know using some more more thinner or shallow or, or whatever you're using and I keep dabbing my brush in the uh, the, the shellite and I keep sort of brushing down and what that does is over time it does two things it certainly creates a lot of the sort of streaking but the other thing it does is it tints the base color so the base color I'm using which is buff is quite light and I wanted something that was a little bit darker but when you're doing this sort of weathering process, you actually want to go lighter because the weathering itself will help to darken up the, the tones. So I just keep working it in, keep working in the same direction. And I'm actually trying to remove as much as of the obvious streaks as possible. So you really want to just keep working it into the color so that's sort of the, the the first I guess the first level the first round and again if I compare this to the other one you can see we're still a fair way off getting to that sort of effect but you can sort of start to see how it's starting to start to build up all right so the next step is to take the uh, earth color and Essentially rinse and repeat, do exactly the same process. So toothpick, take a little bit on the toothpick and just sort of dabs here and there. And it helps to sort of pick out areas where maybe you would expect streaks to occur. So where water would collect and then uh, pull down the you know pull down the dirt. And this colour is going to give us not only a sort of mud streaks, but it's going to give us a bit more warmth in the actual uh, buff color. So it's going to help tint it a um, you know, little bit more into the red spectrum. And you can see yeah, it looks like uh, looks like someone's had an accident on the side of the uh, <laughs> side of the tank, but we're going to knock that right back. Really, it's just about getting those sort of streaks happening and then we can start really knocking it back and you got all the time in the world because this stuff does not dry in a hurry so you can really go to town and then really take your time to knock it right back and go to whatever level you want to for your for your vehicle now my problem with weathering uh, and it's just through lack of experience, I guess. Um, but I, mine, I really struggle to sort of make it subtle. So um, this process is good for people like me who are kind of a bit impatient. Um, and you can really sort of, you know, you can have a look at it once you've done your first sort of level of weathering. You can have a look at it and then come back to it you know, even a long time afterwards and then sort of reactivate the oils and knock them back even further. So, uh, you know, for me it's about trying to knock back as much of this stuff as possible. Now, of course, you're not limited to just browns for doing uh, weathering. You can use greens and blues and all the sorts of different colours. And in fact, the more variety of colour that you use, the more convincing the effect will be. Uh, because, you know, if a surface has been painted and then it comes across, you know, rain and other instances of sort of weathering events that paint may react differently you know it might not just fade it might even change color a little bit all right so let's now compare this so we're sort of getting closer to it you know you can sort of see um, they're starting to look uh, look similar last step uh, for these side skirts is to put the white down. So what the white does is it gives that impression of uh, faded paint, you know, it's been sitting out in the sun. 
a bit too long. So I'm just going to pick out a couple of areas for the white. I don't want to go overboard with the white, I just want to pick out a couple of areas. And then again, it's the same process. I take the, uh, the brush, take a bit of shellite, dab most of it off, and then just streak. And if I wanted to go with a cooler sort of uh, looking color, I could even go with a light blue or a light green or you know, um, a light gray. It's uh, sort of in the cooler side. Um, and again, that would sort of tint your final look and give you something that was maybe a bit cooler. Whereas what I'm going for is something a bit warmer. So hence I've used sort of warm colors. All right, so that is pretty much it. Now I think I need to work on that uh, the bottom one a little bit more um, just to bring it up to the same level but the process is the same like it's just dab on bits of oil paint and then stroke in the direction that the weathering would occur with a flat brush and a bit of your uh, thinner of choice and what I can do is show you the result of that at the level of the hull now I'm missing the side bit here, um, I haven't put that on yet, but you can sort of get a bit of an idea of how that weathering is looking. And again, it's sort of going the direction that you would expect the water to fall. There's a few sort of detailed streaks I've put in around the base of the turret, and also on the, the back of the door. Now underneath, you're not going to see a lot of this at all because once the side skirts go on the wheels and the tracks, you're really not going to see much at all. So I haven't been too fussed about underneath, but obviously there would be more weathering underneath where the tracks are than on the top. And when I do the turret, I'll probably do even less weathering because I think, um, I don't know, I haven't decided yet. I might have to sort of think about that, but uh, I'm pretty... Pretty sort of happy with the level of uh, weathering that. Tried to keep it as subtle as possible. So I'm going to go ahead and do the rest of this sort of first round of weathering. Uh, I do intend on using some pigment powders and some other products as well, but this is sort of the main step, the, the bulk of how I'm going to get the weathering done. So I've done most of the weathering on the hull and the turret, and it's sort of at a point that I'm pretty happy with. I've also installed the glass, so you can see the green uh, glass in there. Installed that, so the hull and the turret are pretty much ready to go. The next thing is the wheel. So here's an example of one of the road wheels that I weathered. And if you compare that to what it was previously, you get an idea there of how much sort of weathering I've done. Um, certainly for the rubber you don't want it to be that super black you want these to look as though they're worn like the tracks have been going over them for some time with the the dust and and what have you that's come off the road so to show you what I did for that first of all I started off with the Penaline accent color the brown I was quite generous getting this in sort of all around the the wheel hub I'm going to do the same thing on the uh, sprocket here. I'm quite generous with the amount of panel line wash I'm going to give it. And for these ones, I'm just going to do a little bit on the back as well. And I might just use a cotton bud just to clean up a little bit of that, but it's not too, uh, it doesn't really matter that much. And for these return rollers, I'm going to, again, just use a liberal amount of the panel liner. And the next step is to use some of the light, light mud, the 502 Abtai Lung oils. And just like I did with the weathering of the hull and the turret, I'm going to take a toothpick just get a little bit on the toothpick and just dab a few bits on here and there. Do the same with the other, other wheels. And then I'm going to take my uh, shellite or you can take your, uh, your enamel thinner, it'll do the same thing. 
dunk my brush in, clean off the excess. And this time I'm going to, instead of sort of swiping it in a particular direction, I'm just going to dab the brush over the wheel. This one's probably got a little bit too much on it. So I don't want it to look as though there's been a brush on it. I don't necessarily need it to be weathered in a particular direction. It's just dabbing it around. And that's pretty much it. I don't really worry about any other sort of colors on the wheels. And the reason for that is I'm going to do a little bit more with some uh, pigments. So for the wheels, I'm kind of happy with that. So the next thing is to look at the rubber part of the uh, return rollers and also the road wheels. And for that, I'm going to use these uh, Tamiya Weathering Master uh, powders here. And this is set H. And what I'm going to use is ivory. So I'm just going to take the applicator, sort of rub it in the, uh, in the powder like this, and then I'm just going to brush it onto the tires, sort of going in the direction that the wheels would be going. Rubbing a bit of excess off with my finger. It doesn't have to be too clean, but what you do need to make sure is that the the weathering powder is sort of going in the direction you would expect the wear to happen. Just use my finger to blend that in a little bit. And also around the, the rims. Yeah. So what you end up with is a nice sort of dusty looking wheel with a bit of mud uh, on the hub. I do the same thing for the Return rollers, so just need a little bit more. Just brush it on in the direction. Now, the majority of the weathering on this tank is dry, so it's it's been wet in the past, but most of the uh, the weathering sort of effects you see, they'll be dry, as in sort of dust and mud that's had a chance to sort of dry on the vehicle. So I'll apply this powder. I don't need to put a matte coat over it or anything like that. Um, you know, this is not going to be an area of the model that's going to be, ever be touched. So I can leave it as is. But that's essentially the uh, the process I've gone through for all the wheels, just to sort of get them at a point where um, they look they look nice and weathered. Okay, the wheels are all weathered up and I've attached them to the bottom of the hull. The two uh, sprocket wheels, um, they'll go on once I've done the uh, the tracks. So that's, um, those wheels are all done. Also to give you a bit of an update on some of the rest of it, so the upper part of the, uh, the main hull, all that weathering's been done. I've done a couple of other things too, like uh, install the clear glass bits in the headlights. So for that, I have used uh, this um, tester's clear part cement. So it's basically like really um, highly refined uh, PVA or white glue. And I've also used some Tamiya clear orange and uh, attach the tow cables. And on the back here, where the exhausts come out, I've actually used one of the Tamiya weathering powders. So for that I've used, um, I've actually used oil stain from Tamiya Weathering Master Set D. So that's all looking pretty good. Um, I've got some stuff drying on the turret, so I'll show you that a bit later. But what I did want to take you through was how I'm going to do the mud on the tracks. So the tracks are rubberized, which presents a couple of problems. If you were to sort of detail paint these, um, you know, rubber tracks do have a bit of an issue where paint sort of uh, cracks and, and what have you. So the method I'm going to use is a combination of sort of dry brushing, and then I'm going to cake it with a pigment powder mix so it sort of looks like caked on mud. If you look at uh, you know these tracks they've got a lot of recessed areas where you would expect you know mud and 
what have you to get caught up in there. So I'm going to show you how I'm going to do that. There are plenty of other methods out there for doing this process, but uh, this is what I'm going to be using. So first of all, I'm going to start with dry brushing, and for that, I'm going to use this uh, Vajo, um Metal Color Steel. So get my palette, and you can see I've already sort of started a little bit of it. And I'll take a nice wide brush, get a little bit on the brush, dab a bit of it off. And literally, I'm just very roughly uh, dry brushing it. And the reason I'm doing that, I'm quite rough with it. I'm not being overly careful with the dry brushing is because a lot of it's going to be covered up with the uh, the mud that I'm going to use. So I'm quite sort of liberal with the, the steel paint. And just sort of running it over. There will be some variation in the amount of paint that's on the surface so you sort of get an idea of yeah, how rough that is compared to the underside which is all black so what I could do is also just do the sides just so I can catch a little bit of the edge now I'm gonna to have to weather these sort of one side at a time now the next step things get a little bit messier so I'm going to bring in I've just got an old uh, modeling box here that I've sort of cut down to size and the reason this gets messy is because I'm going to be using um, these Vajo pigments so here I'm using ochre uh, or light yellow ochre and as the medium you can buy sort of pigment medium that helps this stuff stick but what I find works reasonably well is Mod Podge so I'm just using some matte Mod Podge you really want it to be matte because I want the idea of dried mud if you wanted to go with a wet mud I guess you could try giving a shot with gloss so what I'm gonna do is get some Mod Podge into my little tin here all right and then I'm gonna take my pigment here and I'm going to take my little, little spoon I've got and start spooning it out. Now I've found this stuff actually mixes pretty well with Mod Podge. So, there are of course mediums that are specifically designed for this purpose. Like you could use a matte varnish if you wanted. Medium, it's clear stuff. And what I want to do is sort of get it to a reasonably consistent paste. And really, I guess what you're thinking about is it's it's really um, almost like really thick paint. You know, you're taking the pigment. The Mod Podge is the the carrier for that pigment, and. Just mix it all up and you get like a, it almost looks like a mud slurry so that sort of gives you an idea of the kind of consistency you can see it sort of uh, it sticks pretty well it's not runny at all it holds its shape now I'm going to take a brush and I am going to slop this stuff on because it does not need to be in any way um, precise because that's not how mud works the next thing I do is sprinkle on just a little bit of um, a bit more pigment powder here and there oops a bit much here but that's all right and of course the way you would expect you know the mud to sort of settle on the tracks is that you would expect that there would be some exposed parts of the tracks so that it wouldn't all be completely covered in mud. So what I'm going to do is turn the track upside down. This is where the messy bit gets in, comes in. And I'm actually going to slide it across the, uh, the bottom of the box. Try 
and pick up as much of that dry pigment that's there and really sort of rub it in I like these sort of processes in model making where you get your get your hands dirty. Okay. And really rubbing it in. Alright, so let's have a look at it now. And you can see what it's done is where you would expect the metal tracks to be exposed. But the mud sort of, you know, there's still evidence of the mud there. But the rest of it is being caked in all those kind of recesses in there. So if you imagine this thing's gone through, you know, a whole lot of mud and then it's all sort of dried off. Um, that's the kind of idea you get there. So this bit, I oh, probably need to put a little bit more on. But that's the process I've used so far. I guess you could go through and sort of hand brush every little bit of it if you wanted um, you know if you wanted that sort of high level of detail but for me for the actual tracks I think this works pretty well and of course I need to do the same thing um, on the inside but the inside's going to be a little bit different I think what I'll do is I'll take the same mix but I might just sort of sponge it on here and there because obviously it's not having the, uh, I mean, it's going up against the wheels, I guess. Just to give you a bit of an update on the turret, I am pretty much done with the turret with a few exceptions, but I did want to point out um, a couple of things. First of all, given that this is uh, Bandai plastic, I've had a couple of issues where pieces have broken off because of the enamels that I'm using so just be aware of that um, I've had to fill a part uh, just there just because it broke when I took this uh, cover piece off to install the uh, the glass underneath so just be aware of that it's a sort of very well-known problem with uh, Bandai plastics they handle lacquers fine but uh, you start using enamels on them and they start um, becoming quite brittle so the other thing that I've done is I've added some sort of powder, weathering powder here. Now I kind of expect that this would be an area that people sitting in the cage here, they would grab onto, they'd have, you know, oil on their gloves and that sort of thing. So that's where you would get a bit of, um, you know, a bit of dirt happening. So for that, I've just used uh, the oil stain to me, a weathering master powder. I've also used that on the ends of the, gun barrels um, and a little bit on the, the ladder as well so there's a bit of dirt and grime there like I mentioned I've uh, installed all the, the glass bits so the green glass it's a bit hard to see in this light so the only thing that's sort of missing from this now is the hatch the guns uh, the guns I've just dry brushed using a bit of uh, steel um, I'll install them last along with the aerials and the hatch just because they are quite uh, you know, quite fragile. Now just on the hatch the hinge um, it's maybe a bit hard to see but you'll see that sort of grey mark there so part of the hinge broke off again because of the enamels that I was using so um, I had to sort of glue that back on and as a result the, uh, the hatch sort of barely stays in place it's very um, very fragile. I've finished doing the weathering of the tracks so you can see they're good and muddy I've done the inside not as much on the inside of the tracks as the outside it would you know it sort of makes sense there wouldn't be um, there wouldn't be more on the inside so the next step is to try and get these tracks on onto the bottom of the hull and so the instructions sort of talk about the different wheels that you have and you've got this one which has the sort of octagonal part on the back of it and that goes towards the back of the um, uh, the back of the the tank and we get that on the back here there we go 
Alright, so now I just need to guide the track into the uh, guide horns into the wheels properly. Oops, it looks like it's come off the back a bit. Oh, let's have a look at that. So that's sort of what it looks like. Um, as you can see, you're not going to see a lot of uh, what's going on around the wheels, especially once the uh, the skirts um, are put over. But I reckon that'll do. Looks all right. I am getting bits of my what I call mud podge um, coming off, flaking off, which is all right. It's going to add to the uh, add to the realism of make of mud sort of you know being caked on and then. Uh, coming off, flaking off. So get the uh, get the other side on, and then we can start looking at the final assembly. Okay, so now the uh, the tracks are on both sides. There's a little bit of warping you can sort of see on this one, but I think it'll probably settle down a bit. But anyway, the next bit is to put the top of the hole on. So this sort of slides in there. Here we can sort of see the, uh, the hole with the tracks in place. So pretty happy with the, the look of that. Now I think before I put the turret in, I need to get the driver in first. Okay, so here's my uh, driver with the detachable legs. So let's get him. Yeah, of course he's magnetized so he just slots into place which is great Let's see his head just poking up there um, yeah I just think it's gonna be easier before the the turret goes in place with the uh, the two barrels in the way so for the turret you can see that I have uh, stuck on the antennas or aerials and I need to do a little bit more weathering just um, sort of on the uh, tow cable clips here but also on the bases of the aerial so I'll do that sort of last so let's try and get this on actually I've just done that and I realize what I actually need to do is get the skirts on first so I'm going to take this off because I know I am going to accidentally knock one of those aerials and they're going to come flying off so I'll get the, the side skirts on first So they just uh, snap into place like that. As you can see, you can see very little of the wheels and the tracks now. Um, but it's a, you know, I mean, all the details there. It's just uh, if you wanted to show it without the without the side skirts, you can certainly do that. All right, so it's starting to look like a beast now, that's for sure. All right, now for the turret. You sort of see the, the two slots here that correspond with these little uh, tabs. So pretty usual affair for tanks. Uh, so make sure it's seated down properly and then turn it around, hopefully without decapitating the driver. And there we go. That is very cool. All right, now there are, of course, the uh, machine guns that go in place. So I've got this one here. There we go. Guns on them. Now I have given them a bit of a dry brush with a bit of the uh, the steel. But they do look. Uh, Look very black, so I might have to get a bit of the um, pigment powder on them just to sort of blend them in a little bit. I think. Okay, and then finally, this is probably one of the, the sort of fiddliest bits because the hinge base broke for the hatch, so it's sort of 
sits there in place but not very well um, it'll probably fall off when I hold it up but you get the idea okay so let's get the other figures in okay and these are not magnetized so they're not going to stay there when I uh oops and there goes the hatch but you kind of get the idea of the guys down here and you'll be able to see it you know when I get to the the glamour shots so I've got a few little bits of weathering to do here and there but essentially it's done and just some sort of I guess thoughts about this kit first of all I don't get a lot of opportunity to sort of weather up my kits you know so this has been a, a good experience in that and trying to uh, develop my weathering skills but um, this kit's kind of strange in the fact that they've kind of given indications that there was an intention for some sort of interior and then maybe at the last minute they thought nah that was going to get too expensive so there is an opportunity there if you want to scratch build sort of engine detail or maybe some sort of interior you could uh, you could probably do that the thing I do really like about these kits is that it just taps into that um, that 135th scale um, armor, you know, sort of modeling realm, I guess. But of course, it's sci fi based and it's, you know, in the Gundam universe. So for me, that's, uh, that's really cool. I've spent uh, probably about 55 hours on this kit. So hence why there's been so many videos as part of the build. It's actually been, you know, quite intense. There's been a lot of work in it. And, um, but I'm pretty happy with the result by, um, you know, the figures and, and the tank sort of as a whole. Seeing it all together now, I'm, I'm quite happy with it. So, on with the glamour shots, and until the next build series, I'll catch you later.